Welcome to our first AI session of the school year. We are November 19th, and I reached out to Digital Moment. We have Hermé here with us today. Um, they used to be X, not X, old kids cogenists who have evolved into Digital Moment, and they're dabbling quite a bit in AI. And I attended one of his sessions at, in September, and I just thought it was amazing. So we got to talking and he graciously agreed to come in and share um, kind of like looking inside the AI box. Um, so this is going to be very beginner um, and we'd love questions. If you want to keep them in your mind until the end and we'll have a little bit of time to ask questions, you can throw them in the chat as well and we'll pull those up at the end. Um, this session will go for about an hour. We'll record it, we'll archive it, we'll include all the resources so you can just sit back and enjoy and just listen. Um, Romain's going to have you fill out a form though, just because he has to keep accounting of who joins these sessions. So he's going to share that in the chat, which we would love you to complete. And one other thing, we are going to do a part two. So on January 21st, 3.30 to 4.30 again, we're going to look at integrating AI into your classrooms. So we'll look kind of at subject areas and how AI might be used to leverage some of the subject areas that we teach here in Canada. So without more delay, Ame, I'm going to throw it over to you. And maybe, um, Ame, I'll give you a, a, a cue about five minutes before so that if there's any questions, we can, we can cover those questions. All right. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And yes, we're going to talk about AI. My name is Herman from Digital Moment. And what we're going to do today, as Chris said, is gonna feel very basic. And the reason is that the material that I'm going to present is meant for you to present to your students. So that's why it sounds basic. That's why it seems basic. And we're going to try and understand how to present this information to students so they can work better with this new technology and that you can work better with your students and this new technology. As Chris said, I'm happy to take questions at the end of the session, but also if there's something pressing, anything you want to ask, please unmute, put it in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer. Let me share my screen and let me show you what we're going to start with. The first thing that we're going to talk about is what is this thing of experience AI? That's the name, let's call it of the product, the curriculum or the lessons that we're working on. And we want to know what it is. Why was this created? Who made it? And why it's important for you as an educator? Especially talking to Chris, knowing that now Quebec has guidelines, this is going to make your life easier. So I'm very happy because I feel like I'm providing you a solution. In these slides, we have the slides. The slide deck that you're going to have access to is a little bit longer like this. I shorten it because I know this is a shorter session and I don't want to abuse your time, but then that will have extra information. As Chris said, one of the things that you're going to find in those slides is this form. Please fill in this form. It's really important for us, as Chris said, for us to keep track of what we're doing. We're providing this information thanks to funding by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I appreciate that very much. Then let's go in. Who made this? Was it you, Herman? Who are you, Herman? Why did you create this thing? No, no, it wasn't me in this case. This was designed and created by the Raspberry Pi Foundation in collaboration with Google DeepMind and researchers from Cambridge. So it has the backing of a pedagogical institution on Cambridge. It has the backing of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and their pedagogical approach, which we have seen in the material they created before. And it has the backing of experts on the matter, such as Google's DeepMind. So it's a combination of all these different fronts in order to provide information that is solid, substantial, and useful for your students. Right now, we're delivering this exclusively for Canada, but they're deploying this in many different countries, and we're finding 
great opportunities and very interesting challenges. Let's see what else we have. What do you get with this material? What did they create? They create a set of lesson plans that you can present to your students. Each lesson plans, they have videos in French and in English. There are lesson plans, slide decks, activity sheets. There are many different things for you to use right out of the box. We're going to preview one of those lessons today, LLMs, for you to see what is the structure of each one of these lessons and how can you implement it in your classroom. What are the lessons? There are six core lessons and we have additional lessons. The six lessons, what is AI? A general introduction of what is this thing? What is it doing in our lives? Then we make a jump into what is machine learning? Are these the same things? What are the differences? How can we trust it? How should we implement it or learn or interact with it? We have lesson three, small commercial. Tomorrow I have a lesson three on bias in, bias out, bias out on Evan Bright. We're gonna talk about the bias in AI and the ways that we can detect it, interact, and we offer practical approaches via uh, not teachable machine, uh, machine learning for kids. So it's a fun activity that lets us identify biases using an application. Then we start talking about how AI works like a black box, but which components of AI are transparent and how can we equate those components to video games or to reasoning that we do in, in regular life or in the classroom with decision trees. And then lesson five kind of joins everything together to create with the class, a project that they can study and understand the concepts they learn. And at the end, we provide some ideas on transparency for artificial intelligence and some guidance for future careers for your students. The additional lessons, we have large language models. We're exploring that one today. Biology, how is it being used in conservation? And a practical example. And what is upcoming is responsible AI. So it's going to be really interesting because it's going to cover cybersecurity or safety or, or models within artificial intelligence. So we know who made it, what are the things that we're getting out of it. Now, let's think about the design choices that went into this program. The first one is that we have a concept skill, AI level framework, and a Bloom's taxonomy of how this was created how it's structured so you know what are the prerequisites, what goes first, what goes after, and regardless of which of this one, this framework you want to use, it provides you a pedagogical support to the lessons that you're doing and helps you integrate what you're doing with this program with your curriculum in Quebec. So this links to the other ones. I'm not going to go over those. We're just providing an idea. Now, one of the biggest challenges is that when we are talking about AI is how can we describe AI to an eight-year-old? If we say, can you tell me what is this smart speaker? I'm not going to say the name so I don't trigger you speakers all over the place, but how can we explain this? And I know that all of you have ways of explaining it that are very clear, that are obvious, but with a few challenges. The biggest challenge is when you explain it, will you use words such as understand or listen? These are key parts, and then can you describe it without it? So what I want you to do, can I give you 10, 15 seconds? Think why using understand or listening can be an issue when we're explaining a smart speaker to an eight-year-old. And if you want to tell me, you can tell me, you can hold it to yourself. We're going to continue. So the idea is that why is this an issue? 
The issue is because us as humans are great at anthropomorphizing. My bike is not just my bike. Maybe your bike has a name. Maybe you're deeply attached to that uh, bicycle or to your car or something at home. Then when we train to anthropomorphize, we start giving these human characteristics to these systems and giving human characteristics to artificial intelligence can provide different challenges. What are the challenges? It's going to distract. Why does it distract? It's because we're taking out the creators of the technology, the maintainers of the, te the technology, the providers of the data that was used to create the technology, and we take that part out and we assume the AI or give the AI a personality and we now are out of the picture. And that is not the case. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Right now, we don't know. But in this moment, we are collaborators. It's a tool like a hammer. It's just a really powerful hammer. So that would be the first part. The other one, and I said here, risk a reduction in students' desire to take an active role in wanting to understand how they work and be involved in designing future applications. Why did I read all that? Is because in this process of working with AI, I had my own existential crisis. And I think about this many times. What is my role if AI goes here? But what is my role if AI goes here? What is our role if AI goes here? What is our future interaction? So if we're now that it is a tool for collaboration, we avoid that part of anthropomorphizing, we still have control. If we start taking that collaboration and that concept of working with the AI now, we're putting our students in a huge disadvantage because soon you're going to hear from them to say, why? If so-and-so can do it right away, why am I going to learn this? And then that why of why to do this can just grow and grow and grow. That is a dangerous thing to have. And the other one is that it perpetuates dangers of AI in terms of bias and inequality. Oh, that terrible thing that it said is the AI. It's the AI. No, it's not the AI. Those terrible things that the AI does or says, they come from us. They come from all of us. So we're responsible to understand it, to maintain it, and to embrace a better future by understanding that it's a system. It's still not an embodied system, I will, we will see soon. What is the big change? The big change has been happening. Now the change is accelerated and more interesting, but we're going from rule-based applications when we're talking about coding and designing to data-driven. So this is when we're coding in the past and we were creating a program imperative saying, go here, go there, if not go here, do this, and we're giving these rules for the application in this case to act. But now, what we're giving is lots of data, and the system is processing the information and giving us prediction. So effectively, we're changing, we're jumping from computational thinking rule-based, which is computational thinking 1.0, traditional coding and communication with the machines, to computational thinking 2.0, which is based on data. And maybe I have some computer science educators here that are saying, but coding, but coding. You know what? Coding, I don't see it fully disappearing. What I see it is changing. Coding is not C. Coding is not C++. It's not Ruby. It's not JavaScript. Coding is a language to interact with the machine. So what AI might get us to do is to code in natural language, where we have a more natural and simpler interaction with the machine. And we're seeing that right now. So keep in mind, we don't anthropomorphize. The second thing, the word intelligence is a distraction. 
because it's generating very interesting philosophical discussions. But in this case, intelligence, if we didn't have that word there, maybe it would be much easier for us to understand it and to present it to our students. That is the general, like we're done, bye. No, <laughs> we're gonna do more, but this is the pedagogical concept. I want to add one last thing. In what I've been seeing, talking with different boards, educators all over the country, is that I start seeing that AI comes as a pyramid that has three different levels. The bottom level, we need to provide a fundamental concepts to our students. They need to know the basics. They need to know one plus one. They need to understand the bare minimum thing of what the technology is, what are the benefits, what are the drawbacks, what are the challenges, because they're using it with us and without us. So we want them to understand that better. Experience AI covers that level. That's what we're doing. Level two is what you, all of you as educators, can do for your practice in order to make it easier, to make it more diverse, to make it more interesting, to make it more appealing to different audiences is that you can use the technology to enhance your delivery and to make tasks easier. Level number three is the one that I'm very happy that Quebec had guidelines because now is after these two are covered is how do we get to interact with our students for them to use the technology. One of the biggest things that I've seen across the board is that that question to most teachers is not that hard to solve. The answer that I've heard is, we know how to teach, we know how to inspire, we know how to get them to search for things, how to reason, how to project, how to create. And that is key. What is gonna change has changed in the past, you will not very likely evaluate in the result as we were not evaluated the result when we were in our algebra class. If I say the answer is 42, meaningless, show me the process. So maybe show me what are the queries, what were you thinking about, what were the challenges, what are the sources. That part, all of you as educators have it covered. Now, this is the final survey that please, please, please do also fill up. Now, what we're going to do is that we know the pedagogical concept, but I'm going to take you to Experience AI. So Experience AI, you can access in the slides, there's the link. You don't need me, I'll be happy to support you along the way, but you don't need her man. You just go to, to Digital Moment Experience AI, you sign up and you can use this on your own. And you have a lot of information let me show you the lessons. In the lesson, you have all this that is gonna help you. This is the educator guide that is gonna show you, once again, the Bloom's taxonomy, all these parts. And on top of that, it's gonna show you the connections to UNESCO guidelines for AI. It also has that right now, and it's been increasing. We're working hard or doing something like this where we have each one of the guidelines and how does experience AI fit within that. That's something that is not ready yet, but we're working on. We have the six lessons and we have the additional lessons. We're gonna take a peek into LLMs. Each one of the lessons looks the same, same structure. You won't feel lost, you won't feel confused, and then you can get the grasp of what you need really fast. All of them has a small description. They have a more small description, objectives, vocabulary, structure. And then it lets you, if you want, to download everything as a package, or this is my lesson plan. This is the slide deck. We're gonna use this slide deck. The beautiful thing about having this slide deck is that it's always up to date. Every time that they're doing research, they update it, I go there, I get the new one. And I have my teacher guide. In the teacher guide, 
what am I getting? Getting all the information that I need for this lesson. What is it about? What is it gonna happen? What are the expectations? All the things that you prepare really hard for are here, and we have the activity sheets. Things for you to know how to answer some concepts that are a little bit obscure, and the other one is how to guide your class. Let's take a look at this slide. So we're gonna go into LLM slides. Let's go with the slideshow. They follow this format, and then the LLMs, the large language model, want you to put yourself not as an educator. Think that you're one of your students, and as one of your students, you're experiencing this concept. You're experiencing these ideas that you're presenting. Imagine how this can support their learning and their interaction with AI in their normal life in or outside of school. So in this one, they will be able to describe the purpose of LLMs. Why do we have LLMs? Why were they created? And how are they changing what we do? Recognize and discuss, discuss the output of an LLM uh, is not always trustworthy. It's super important. Can we trust it? Should we doubt it? When is it trustworthy? When does it work? And I'm going to give you an analogy of how to think about an LLM that I hope is going to stick with you. And then at the end, what we're going to close the session with is with the evaluation of how appropriate an LLM is to be used in different contexts. And there's a catch. There's one that seems very clear, but it's not. So we're going to see that at the end. So I'm, I'm giving you teasers for the end of the session. Okay. The first part, remember I told you that I want to give you something that you can use and you can use with your students to associate with an LLM. I'm gonna give you facts about a friend. I'm sure all of you have a friend that meets these characteristics, or maybe you're that friend. This friend sometimes is right. That is me, sometimes. Not very often, but sure, we're there. Sometimes entirely wrong, sadly, for sure, me many times. So I fit the characteristics so far. The other one, sometimes in between. Yeah, for sure. This one is the tricky one. Always is 100% confident they're right. Ah, I see faces and some of you are like, oh, I know. Yes, I know who that is. Of course, we work, we, we live, we play with people like this. I want you to think of an LLM with having these characteristics. Plus, there's no way for you to know right away if they're right or wrong. They exude so much confidence and they're so suave and clear that you said, of course, they're right. And they answer right away and so easily give us what we want. So keep that in mind. ChatGPT, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, yes. So very important to keep that in mind and equate that your interactions with LLMs with this concept. Imagine how can one of your students understand this? How can they internalize it? How can this raise their awareness? How can we take them to a higher level of critical thinking when they're engaging with these systems? We're not gonna go too deep into this, but we know large language models, they're doing prediction, and we've seen them in auto completing things in Google Docs, in Word, in many places for a long time. It's just they're getting more and more advanced, but they're doing prediction. We're gonna learn a little bit about this prediction shortly. So then we get a chance to explain they are a type of AI that uses a lot of data in order to train, and they're designed to generate text responses. Another way to think about this is that LLMs have been created for us to be able to interact with our machines in a more human-like way. We're finding a language that is easier for us because we don't go and write 00110001 because it's too hard to manage, but then the closer it gets to natural language, the easier it is for us to interact. And LLMs are helping, helping with that. Speech recognition, correct? Yes, very good. And speech recognition is very interesting because 
is doing first it needs to understand oh understand it first needs to take the, the information in sound transform that into words written words then it needs to take those words and do a, an analysis of those words in order to try and make sense of that sentence and then it needs to reverse the whole thing to give you an answer so super interesting great idea this your kids have done this you have this done this write a poem and then it goes it writes a poem something that i know i've shown this to several english teachers and very unimpressed but then you show to someone with my capacity to write poetry and i'm just in awe of how amazing this is depends who you show it to but then for this works pretty well and then it can give you an idea of what it can do but if we're talking to one of our students, let's think we have a 13-year-old that needs to do uh, a paper of the life in Shakespeare, Shakespeare's England. What we don't want is for them to go write a paper of the life in Shakespeare's England. I'm sure that you received papers from 13 year olds that are more complicated than PhDs that anybody has written. And then your journey, no, <laughs> go back and try it again. So that's one part, but then we know they're going to be using it. Why don't we invite them to help themselves by having the system providing guidance, providing a structure, we're starting, not starting with an empty page. I need to write this. I don't know what to do. Maybe tell me where to find some information. Give me a structure that is going to help me create the paper and be more interesting. So a way of how can we work with this? Uh, perfect. Thank you. So now, are the predictions always correct? We have this question, very important, as these LLMs are changing and evolving, this is going to become hopefully relevant. I can wait, but right now it's still very relevant, is because I want you to think about this, all of you. How many countries are there starting with the letter V? You can put it in the chat, you can think it, you can give me account with numbers or just say mm, i'm not going to say it to anybody but i think there are so so you have that number in your mind chris you said four to five yeah that's non-committal yeah that's it's one of those it's around there perfect if it was me i would have said maybe one to seven <laughs> but yeah you went yep carolyn says 12 let's see one to three 12 great so we have all this then we're trying to see, and when we had one of the ChatGPT says, there is only one country in the world that starts with the letter V. All of us were like, no, I, I know at least two, but a 13 year old says, great. And it says the name is Vanuatu and it's a Pacific. So it's giving me a lot of information. So confident, perfect. Let me send my report about Vanuatu. And then we say ChatGPT or Gemini or Claude, are you really sure that that's it? And then it says, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Three, Venezuela, Vietnam, Vatican City, where's Vanuatu now? So what happened? What is the truth? And the interesting thing is that I have many answers here, but when I went researching, you know what? Depends who you ask. <laughs> there are some some international entities that recognize the Vatican City as a country, some that don't. So it's, what is the answer? It's complicated, that's everything. So it depends what are you basing your information on. Sometimes bias. You know this is gonna be horrible. You know it is gonna be biased, but let's think about it. We have this, and we're gonna say to one of these LLMs, give me a few hobbies for my friend Reggie. What can Reggie try? And then it says, sure, photography, cooking, playing a musical instrument, hiking, woodworking. That sounds all great, sounds good. Then we say, what about for Sophia? Sure, we start just 
doing a face palm, I think it's time to do a face palm because if we know where this is going, then it says, yeah, painting, yoga, writing, bird watching, and dancing, which they're all fine, but we know that there's something that is heavily skewed. So these things are biased. Let me go back here before we leave. This part is they're biased, but by them being biased, is helping us all to understand our own bias. And it's going, it's helping us understand societal bias that creep in into this model. And then it helps us start the conversation of why is this happening? And in conversations that I had with AI scientists and computer science, these are not evil people. They just have blind spots. They don't have enough data. They don't have any information. So they need people like us, all of us everywhere, to start raising our hand and saying, we have an issue here. We have an issue here. And we need our students to understand this. So with this part, you could say, this is my first lesson that I give to my students on LLMs. Let's see how they feel right now. We start asking questions. We're going to continue. We're good on time yet then it provides like a recap of the words that we saw, and then can talk about data. And in data is that we've been saying that when we're talking about LLMs, we're talking about prediction, but the way that the LLM learn, the AI or the machine learning system learns is by using lots of data, lots of training data. Why is important to know about these data, this amount of data and the quality of the data that the LLMs are using in order to help us make better decisions and better interactions with the system. First is that we can say, for example, in weather forecasting, what can we use? We can use temperature, pressure, wind speed. There are so much information that goes into creating a weather forecast. That will be something for an AI system on weather forecasting. But what about for LLMs? What do we use for LLMs? You can, you're very good at putting things in the, in the chat. So I'm going to give you some time. What data do you think have all these companies used to train the LLMs? Cookies, that's an interesting I mean, answer. You, yeah, yes, Chris? Do you mean like what kinds of information might it access that's on, on the World Wide Web? Correct. So in order to have the large language model answer questions to us, they need to have source data to understand how to answer these questions, how to create these sentences. What is the data? Is it scientists are writing data for, for the system to understand? A uh, rule that says, a uh, Chris says wiki, rule that says real conversation, transcripts from podcasts, very good. What else do you think will you use? Let's say that I give you that task. Tonight you need to create an LLM from scratch. What are the ingredients? Research, app data, very good. Encyclopedia. Very interesting. So we see that we need lots of text, lots of words. Where can we get those? Books, blog posts, newspaper, newspaper. Great, Lexi, you're spot on. All of you have a great idea. Let's take a look at what has been used. ChatGPT 3 seems like in the dark ages was like what, six months ago? Unacceptable. So we see this is the composition. I want you to take a look and tell me what do you think about this composition? Is this great? Can be improved? What issues can this data bring to the answers that we receive? Reddit is concerning. Right away, you just you had a red flag. Reddit, mm -hmm. yes. 
So that's a very interesting one because Reddit, it does have a lot of text. It has a lot of text on many, many subjects and they're trying to filter it by having only things that have three upvotes. But we know that there's a lot of bias, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of issues happening in Reddit that are being taken into account. Three of votes, I know. <laughs> so many of votes, three. Uh, book corpus may have a lot of fiction and reliable data. Interesting. So maybe if we had a lot of fiction, is it going to be dystopian or utopian? Then does that influence the way that the sentences are, are going to be construed, constructed? That's an interesting thing. Uh, unpublished books, yeah. Uh, without necessarily having gone through the review process. Exactly. And the reality is that nobody goes through the review process because there's so much data. One of the biggest concerns right now for the creators of artificial intelligence, especially large language models, they're running out of data to train their models. So that's one of the biggest issues. We're running out of data to train the model. They're exploring at the moment ways to generate synthetic data with the model. Because the issue that we face, if that doesn't happen, is that we're going to be training the model with data that was created by the model. That just sounds, my brain can handle that. I'm sorry, I need to take a pause, but that's going to be interesting. Isn't there a better way to filter the data? There should be. The issue is that we're talking of such huge amount of data that there's no way to filter. If we think what is the way that the filter happened, usually we have training data, then the model gets trained, and then after something that most companies are doing is called human reinforced learning. So there's reinforced learning where the system tries to get better, but now is using humans, a lot of people trying to interact with the, the machine and providing reinforced learning. You, 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 and me, we have done it. If you have ever clicked an up, down, thumbs up or thumbs down in any of the LLMs, we're providing human reinforced learning. And we can complement that with a short explanation. So all these things have issues. The reality is that there's no perfect data, but it's very important to know if it's common crawl, that means regular websites from 2011 to 2021. That has been expanding, but then when we had just that range, that means that we were missing a lot of information from before and after. And also, I hope I don't offend anybody, but there's a lot of flat earthers in this 60%, then all that information gets there. Web text, Reddit, you flagged it right away, all of you, because, because Reddit. Human reinforced data is better quality. It's better quality, not the data is not better quality, but because humans are interacting with the model itself, they're helping the model get better. What is this relying on? And that's a very good question, Vola, is that it's relying that all of us, when we're interacting, we're being good citizens and we're providing good information. If we don't vote things that are good and we have both things that are bad, then we're kind of confusing the system. But in general, humans, we're good. We can be bad, but I, I think we're good. So that is kind of the idea. Uh, book corpus, very interesting what you said. What I like about book corpus is that it's going to present a language that is it is it better structured, ideas are constructed, it has been thought a little bit more, so it provides a little bit more of, of depth and maybe grammar and those sort of things that we might be missing it everywhere else. But then again, as you said, there's going to be a lot of fiction, which might be good, might be bad, depends on how the training goes. And Wikipedia, Wikipedia is fantastic, but Wikipedia is everything. So it's you need to weigh your things, but when you don't know what this information is coming from, then you're like, okay, let, let's see, what do I get? Critical thinking. 
that's what we get. So we need to be mindful of accurate and biased and trustworthy to know those things. Now, after you show this to your students, we're going to do something that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but hopefully that's the future of AI. We're going to be thinking of talking about what a search engine is and how it works. In the future, it's going to be the same thing talking about AI. It's going to be ubiquitous, but right now it's not. So what we do is that we invite our students, what is a search engine? Just think, pair, and share. Why do you use it? Why does it exist? And what we want to do here is after we explain how it works, which we all know, is that we're going to get them to evaluate the results from an LLM versus a search engine. So they know when can they use one or the other and what are the challenges with both. What we can see here is that the Wimbledon laid this final in 2019. So this is a website that provides information. This is the LLM answer. Right off the bat, I like this so much better. There's no noise. I'm getting all the information in a table. I see that and I feel just happy. This one I see a little bit, seems pretty good, but then I know I need to dig deeper. Great, so do we go here? I see an issue right away. This game, Serena Williams, 6262, Simona, 6262, who won? I have no idea. If I had this information, I don't know. If I start looking here, oh, it's very clear who won. So these, I already have a problem to start. But now let's take the information from the Google search, let's put it on a table, let's take our time, and let's compare them and we start seeing inconsistencies. Why? Because we know about hallucinations. Why hallucinations? Why do we get these things that make no sense? That would be the question of your students, but this is so much better. I can't just ask one thing and I get everything. Why don't I go here? So let's take a look. We can say, like we saw before, help me structure something for the 2019 Wilbendon game. Just give me a structure and I'll look for things. And in the future, and now in many cases, give me information, but provide citations so I can go and check. Where is the paper coming from? Where is the website? Is it reputable? Is it something I can trust or not? So this gives us the idea of that concept, but still the question remains. Why are we getting that problem? Why isn't it just evident? So the main thing is not human. We have a video. We still have some time. I need to see to share. I need to stop sharing and share again, Chris, correct? With the audio enable? I think I do. I think so. Um, you might be able to just share without leaving. Leanna, can mm. he just share his audio without having to like unshare a screen and stuff? Or does he have to unshare screen and then share? Uh, I can unshare really quickly. Let, let me see. Or let okay. me see if I can do it here. And I say that I just want this tab and share sound. And share. See? Oh, the computer is mad at me asking for things. Permission. Give me one second. Okay. This is what I don't. Share. Good. So you should be able to hear this. Give me a thumbs up if you hear not yet, soon. Now. Great. What is artificial intelligence? Like a robot that thinks and controls itself? Is it like smart speakers and chatbots? I've heard of AI like making art and, you know, controlling the enemies in video games. Really powerful supercomputers that are going to steal our jobs. Um, like the algorithms that control what we see on social media. Everyone has different ideas about what AI means, but it's also not a futuristic sci-fi concept. You might have heard about self-driving cars, art competitions, or video games involving AI. So what's the reality? Is artificial intelligence going to take over the world or is it just a buzzword for a fancy algorithm? 
To find out, I've come to London to speak to the people that create and research artificial intelligence systems here at DeepMind. DeepMind is a team of scientists, engineers, and more with the goal of advancing science and benefiting humanity using AI. Oftentimes here, these kinds of uh, even apocalyptic scenarios of AI is coming to replace humans. I don't think AI is very well represented in movies, I'll put it this way. One example is whenever I go home, my dad asks if uh, we're going to invent like Skynet or Terminator. I think they assume it's um, a system that's a lot more intelligent than it actually is. I've heard that like you go away from your desk and you come back 30 minutes later and the machine's doing things you couldn't believe. It's working so well. I've never had that happen, so it doesn't yet feel like a collaboration between me and a machine where we're cooperatively working. It feels like you know me aggressively forcing the machine to do things until it works. But it's I think it's very dangerous to start saying we can assign like human emotions and motivations um, to a model. Say, oh, this model has um, is funny or kind or, or or distrustful. But AI isn't like you know robots that destroy humanity. It's um, a powerful technology that we can use to help people and you know, build really useful things. AI to me is a field of computer science that relies on data in order to problem solve. AI, I guess, is a constantly evolving field. Uh, it's important to recognize that it's not maybe one static thing. Uh, it is not embodied intelligence. It is an idea and a goal. Artificial intelligence is a really powerful tool if used properly, but it is exactly that. It is just a tool. It is something that will help humans augment their capabilities, uh, automate away the parts of their work that might be too boring or tedious for them, and basically leave more time to do the really creative and interesting parts of what your job is all about. So artificial intelligence isn't about creating thinking robots that are going to take over the world. AI is a set of tools and techniques that we can all use to help solve complex problems using computers. So, I like showing this video for two big reasons. First one is because you see the Google DeepMind logo, they mention what Google DeepMind is, and that's okay, but you don't have to show this video. That is very important because some of your students might not like to see it. They're going to think it's a commercial for Google. The other ones don't have that much reference towards DeepMind. It's completely agnostic of any platform that you're presenting. Each one of the lessons has a video that you can use. You don't have to use it. And the tools that they're promoting for us to learn with AI, they're all open source and created for everybody to use without login. So that's very important. That's the first part is keep that in mind that it says DeepMind, Raspberry Pi, but you can use this without any of those logos. It's not tied to any anything like that. The second part is that it's important to see what is the other side? What, what are the researchers doing? What do they think? And to humanize researchers sometimes because we detach ourselves from the research and from science and it is, they become one of the days that we use in our life. It's they do this, they do that, and just people like us. So it always does this, but then I knew that. Then things that I like, I like this, I like this one very much because it aligns to what we were saying that is, it's not embodied intelligence. It's a tool separate. One of the things that if any of you have coded, it feels like that every time. It's not like you do something like magic or you write like a prose. You're always forcing things to make things happen. Perfect. Google and Microsoft emissions have increased by nearly 50% because of AI data centers when they aim. Yes, that is 100% a huge problem. I'm not going to bury that. I accept it, I understand it, and it's something that needs to be dealt with. What I don't know, and this I'm not going to speak as digital moment or as the person that is presenting this information to you, just as a person, does it mean that I should stop using AI? 
does it mean that I should become, become maybe more responsible in the way that I use it? Maybe it means that we need to start focusing on models that are more efficient and that are providing more self-sustainable sources of energy to maintain them. I think those are really interesting questions and I'm really happy you bring them up, Carolyn, because it's a reality. And we cannot hide behind the fact that this is very interesting, that is amazing, because there are problems. There are problems with the future of purpose, the future of work, the future of human interaction, the climate change. There are many, many problems that exist. And this, I will invite you to present it as something that helps your students in their use with a technology they're already interacting. But I don't know if it's something that we should present as something to embrace and push at this moment. Not fully sure. I wish I could give you an answer, but I don't have the big answer. Thank you for that. So we have this idea. What we're going to do now, we're not going to do this a group because I know it's always complicated to do it in a group. But remember when we say, why are we getting these false apps? Why are we getting hallucinations? And the activity that you do with your kids, and it does work great with kids or in person, is that you're going to have them take turns. You're going to say, we're going to write a four-star review of Pepito. Tell me what. And Pepito says, of a movie. Perfect. So each person adds a word. Why Write a four-star review of a movie. Then the other person adds a word. That place. So I'm so sorry that that, that was my mic drop. I just finished the sentence and left. I apologize for that. But then things happen. So we were almost there. We were talking about the importance of providing context. There's one last thing that I would like to show is the one that says to LLM on LLM. I know we're almost at time. I don't want to keep you longer, but just one more slide. I think it's important for us to do two different things. So let me share my screen. We do this and then we go over some question uh, there to share. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the concept of model cards. And model cards is something that several companies are using in order to bring transparency to the models they're creating on AI so that people know when they can use that model, if the model was trained uh, with what type of data. And this goes to what Caroline was saying. I think it would be great if those models can say, you know what, this model was created with this type of energy. We have this energy that we are producing ourselves with this solar farm. And that can be a way that can promote uh, ethical sourcing of energies and sustainable energy consumption, something to consider. But in this case, what we're going to take a look at is that it mentions a model card. Where does this model card come from? So what we can do is that in Experience AI, said, what is the model card in our lesson? It's right here. And this is a very simple model card. Model cards are complex, long technical documents with very clear information for users to understand how to use it. But this one is a simple one that says it's called Blah, a horrible name. The description is, is a large language model to meant to talk to people. Intended use, used to provide answers to problems and aid creativity. So it doesn't seem like it's fully trustworthy, but it does things. Limitation, it uses data from various sources. So as we saw from the ones we explore, and it can give us things that are harmful, offensive, inaccurate, biased. So we know we are facing this. And this is where the data comes from. So if we present this to our students and say, considering the information in this model card, Let's take a look and let's see. Let me go back here. 
what would you think in these three cases? Let's go from bottom to top. If you are a 14-year-old art student researching facts about famous artists, do you think that this is a good scenario to use an AI model to assist you, an LLM? Yes or no? You can put it in the chat, yes or no. You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I see one thumbs up from Melanie. Chris says, sure, why not? Sounds perfect, good. The blah model provides facts and creativity, so it would say, great, that's very good. Thank you, Liana. It depends on how we use it. That is also correct, Leonor. And in this case, it always depends. But to start with, if it's going to give me some created output, seems okay, because facts is heavy, heavy work. Yes, not the best of three, in my opinion. The 14-year-old can use Google. Yes, very good. I like these opinions and different ways. So this is a maybe. Let's say it's a maybe. I think that way we will remain framed. The second one is a playwright looking for inspiration to help write a scene, a scene for the next day show. We're also facing here someone that is doing something creative, but now is a professional, is a playwright, and there's for their work. What do we think? Yes, as long as it's facts are checked, that sounds very good. Inspiration, yes, yes. So good. This kept us friends. The first one, a doctor to help them diagnose patients who present with uncommon system, symptoms. That sentence always sounds so weird. So I'm a doctor and I have a patient that comes to my office and the symptoms, they're very strange. Should I, can I? Lexi said, I hope not. You better not. Mary said, no way. So these are interesting, very strong reactions. It might give some clues, yes and no. And that's the part that is very interesting. And that's why the key to the whole thing at the end is that it depends on expertise. The doctor can go to the model because the doctor is an expert on their field. And then what they're trying to see if is the model brings something that they missed. Maybe they forgot and they said, oh, that makes sense. Let me check or no, that is nonsense. I'm the expert, I take the decision. In the classroom, all of you are the experts. You are the ones that know what's best for your students, what is the best to interact with them, what is the best way to guide them and support them. So always rely on your expertise. And I think with that, I can say like my daughter used to say, thank you for listening to my presentation. Any question? Thanks, Emily. That was amazing. Very cool. My, my brain's buzzing right now, but we do have another session, January 21st. Please coming back. Uh, we'll look at more classroom stuff. But I thank you so much. I mean, you can tell like we're almost 20 minutes over and like we're all still here, just fascinated by it. So I do appreciate your time and I appreciate all your time for coming and joining us today. Um, it's been a great session. And like Elmay says, you can reach out to them. They're digital moment. They work with schools. They support schools. Um, if you want them to come in or talk with your staff or with your kids or whatever it might be, um, he's an amazing presenter. So I, I recommend it.